Hello, my name is Mark Taylor. Welcome to this three podcast network, which includes the shows Education on Fire, sharing creative and inspiring learning in our schools, Learning on Fire, Education from Sharing Wisdom, Not Testing, and the National Association for Primary Education. Find out all you need to know at educationonfire.com. There comes a time in every person's life when you realise it's not about doing what you are told, but doing what you know is right for you. Let us take a journey of learning and discovery with the world's most successful people who are living the life of their dreams, walking through life using their inner wisdom and being of service to others. Forget exams, grades and test scores. What is your purpose? As we let go of what we think should be and learn from our elders to gain knowledge, inspiration and a true sense of who we are. What are your dreams? Does your life have meaning? Are you living a life of significance? Let's talk with today's guest. Hello and welcome as we spend some more time together on the Learning on Fire podcast. Today I'm talking to Courtney Harris. Hi Courtney, thanks for joining me and let's explore the journey of who you are. Awesome, thanks Mark. I'm so excited to be here and uh, thanks for uh, this conversation. So as you said, my name is Courtney Harris and I am the owner and founder of Courtney Harris Coaching. In this role, what I do is I support teenagers and their parents through the journey of an interesting but often challenging time of life that is full with, full of transition, full of exploration of identity for both the young person and parents. And you know, I serve families to help them find solutions that bring connection and and bring the the family to a place of peace in the midst of these interesting times. So thanks so much for for hosting this talk and I'm happy to be here. Uh, It's fantastic and I think it's it's a really important thing you know people listening are going to be parents they are going to be teenagers they are going to know exactly what you're talking about (laughs) as you very well sort of set that up Um, and and I think the most important thing is the conversation it's just normalizing the fact that this is the reality for the majority of people a lot of the time and then from there you can sort of demystify it and, and start to understand how that sort of thing works. Yes, yes. And I actually like that you use the word normalizing. And I kind of, uh, you know, the way I think of it is that I want to normalize the fact that we might really be having a tough time in these adolescent years. You know, for some people that comes in, um, you know, middle school or in high school, right? It comes at different stages of development. Other times it happens in college. Um, And the, the thing is, we can normalize that these times of life can be challenging but we don't have to normalize it in the sense that we just kind of let the struggle be. We normalize it so that we can, as you said, have these conversations and and work through it, not in a way of pushing through, but in being with ourselves and being with one another and so that we can, you know, sustain ourselves through these times. And in terms of different countries and that kind of thing, you're obviously um, over in the U.S., um, and obviously this podcast is, is being recorded in the U.K., and we have audience all around the world. Does that actually matter very much in terms of how you go about your coaching and how we go about discussing these things as parents and children? Or, or do you think there's actually just sort of an, an I guess, a, a thread which is the same no matter where you happen to be living around the world? Yes, great question. I think it's a, a both and kind of question where most primarily, yes, these transitions of adolescence are related to neuroscience, they're related to the development of the brain, you know, so part of it is just a universal experience of growing up and having a changing brain and beginning to, you know, look at the social world, look at what's around you and sort of figure out who am I in relation to this and how do I want to be in these situations and these communities and environments. And so in that sense, yes, it's universal no matter where clients, you know, no matter where clients I work with are living, no matter where teenagers and parents that are listening to this live, there is a universal truth. And then, yes, of course, there are different cultural components that exist, you know, within particular Um, cultures, particular families, particular schooling systems, there may be um, trends or other pressures or other supports, right, that can influence in one way or another. So, you know, that's why I say it's the both and. (laughs) Yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So if you had to get across the sort of the most important information that you would like 
a teenager to really understand and one piece of information that a parent would like you'd like a parent to understand in terms of really helping each other in this in this scenario what do you think those would be well i think the the truth that can be quite hard to see during these times is that everyone is really looking to belong and be significant um, I come from the positive discipline background, so I'm a positive discipline parent educator, and within this particular framework and philosophy of parenting, one thing that we discuss is that all humans are motivated by these two things, that we want to belong and we want to be significant. So the way I see it is that if a parent is you know, continuing to offer support and is continuing to say, I'm here, I'd love to talk to you, I'd love to listen, and the teenager is feeling frustrated, if they can remember that their parent is just trying to belong in that relationship and is just trying to be you know, a significant or important part of the teenager's life, it may help them soften a little bit and receive. Um, and on the other hand, if a teenager is presenting what we might con- you know, may consider undesirable behaviors, if parents have this lens, they can understand that the behaviors, um, the maybe like talking back or the trying to take control or pushing boundaries and not showing up for curfew, those types of things are actually ways that the teenager is trying to experiment with their sense of belonging and significance. So that's kind of the, the gem of, you know, what I'd like to share is that that is, a motivator for so for so much of our human behavior and so if we can really know that about one another particularly in our family systems I believe we'll be able to come to connection a lot faster. Um, I really love that and, and the one thing that really struck me then was the fact that the parent belonging in that relationship you always sort of think of it or maybe that's because I am a parent now that you know that where where does the child where where does the younger person fit within it and you can understand that that's different when they're before their teens and then as they get into their teens and like you say they're trying to push boundaries they're trying to find their way but of course Mm -hmm. it is different for the parents as well and I'm not quite sure I'd appreciated it in quite that same way that we're all sort of jockeying for position and to sort of understand what (laughs) our role is in that relationship as it develops from a parental point of view as well. Yes, yes. And it really does change, you know, throughout the the years. And when teenagers begin to experience greater independence, maybe they begin to drive, they begin to take the subway alone, they begin to, uh, you know, they, they can talk to their teachers and advocate for themselves. You know, there's all these ways that teenagers are literally forming independence, and they still need support, and they still benefit from guidance and love and care and support from their, their families and parents. Um, but I think what I'm often hearing from parents is that they're trying to figure out what, how do they offer that support in this time in which a teenager does want independence and in which, you know, the parents, they often want to give more independence because yes, they want their child to be, um, contributing and to be taking responsibility. So it can sometimes feel fragile because there's a, there's a big shift happening and it, it really is a change of identity for both the teenager and the parent. And what guidance can you give when a teenager is really deciding to push those boundaries? Like you say, maybe it's a curfew, maybe it's answering back, whatever it happens to be. What's the what's the role really as the parent? I mean, sort of sat here sort of while we're just chatting, it's very easy to sort of think about having that bird's eye view, understanding where they're coming from, understanding all the racing hormones and all of those are things. But it's very different in the heat of the moment, isn't it? And um, I just mm. wonder what your thoughts are around around those sort of real friction points and where the sparks can fly and when you really need as much understanding as you can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, the first thing that came to mind as you were describing that was the fact that, and I follow Dan Siegel's work, and he talks about the way that if one of us, if one person in a situation has what he calls a flipped lid, which means, you know, you're very activated, you're very charged, and so your thoughts and your feelings and behaviors are now coming from your limbic system, not from your prefrontal cortex, um, and if one person in the room is operating from their their limbic system, which means really mostly from their emotional center, of course, this is an oversimplification disclaimer. <laughs> um, but, you know, if we're operating from our emotional center and not from our rational problem solving thinking brain, 
what happens is that that will trigger or simulate other people in the room and then their lids will be flipped. And so, you know, soon enough you have everybody in the room very activated and unable to, to maybe kind of, um, think in a rational way or offer some sort of support in that moment. And so to me, what first comes up is take a break. (laughs) And, you know, really in a sense, this is just that everybody has permission to take pause and to know that even though there will feel like a sense of urgency to address a a problem in the moment, or there's a sense of urgency to step in and to offer guidance, it can actually be done in a much more efficient and connected way when everyone is acting, you know, from a place of calm. And so taking breaks is, is not about being avoidant. It's truly about acting and parenting in a way that is sustainable. So that was my first thought. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that that makes a lot of sense. And and just following on from that, then what 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 are those kind of follow up things which you think are then um, very beneficial? I mean, like I say, mm-hmm. the emotion's gone, everyone's calmed down, but we then also know that teenagers then may not actually want to talk about it, or they may might not want to get involved in it. How do you go about creating that environment where actually you can get across your point of view? You can say what you believe is behavior which maybe not be acceptable but in a way that still engages them in in the sense that they feel like they're not being um I guess got at or or that they're going to be in trouble in any way Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah good questions I love the way you're asking questions it's helpful and you know what I would say I have a couple different tools that are coming to mind but when you take the break you say hey I'll, I'll check in with you in 20 or 30 minutes right so establish don't just leave the kid or don't just leave them you know unsure of what's happening So the step one is acknowledge, hey, I will check you, I I will check in with you in this many minutes. So that's step one. Step two is really taking a focus on solutions. So rather than addressing what we might call uh, consequences, even natural consequences, it can be really helpful for the parent to take the lens of let's focus on a solution. And so when you come to the table or you come to the conversation with your teenager, Um, You can acknowledge, thanks for um, understanding that I needed a break. And then you might next ask for permission and say, are you open to having a conversation? Okay, if you get the agreement, then the next step would be explaining in a as much of a neutral way as possible what the behaviors are. So what the um, situation is. So I really recommend following nonviolent communication. And this is a four step communication process um, that you know you could go into deep studies with but I'll just talk about the basics and in this case the parents may say um, when you're showing up for curfew late each night I feel so the first part is the observation when whatever is happening when you come home late from cur- or come home past your curfew the second part is how you feel I feel concerned Um, And then the third part is to express a need. And so then the need might be um, because I need open communication, right? So the parent is going to, I'll I'll kind of back it up and give the steps (laughs) again. So the parent acknowledges, thank you for taking the break. They ask for permission to have the conversation. And then they start with this nonviolent communication, expressing what's happened, how they're feeling and what their need is. And then they're going to pause and listen. So take a take a moment to see how the teen responds. And then they would actually invite the teenager to work towards a solution or an agreement. And so they might say something like, are you willing to come up with a different solution? Or are you willing to try something new? And just begin the conversation in that lens of solving a problem together. Those are my initial thoughts in, in that kind of situation. And of course... Each family or each situation might be a little bit different, but this is kind of my universal um, starting point. And if you don't get a positive response, for whatever reason it happens to be, or you you seem to go around the same cycle, is it just a question of reframing (laughs) it in some way, or is it a question of... So if, 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 if that dialogue doesn't happen in that sort of we're sorting it out together, where, where do you go from there? Yeah, that's a... Um, so this is a sort of process that you sometimes have to wait out a little bit. And what I remind parents is that if this is a new technique that you're trying, if this is the beginning of approaching communication in this collaborative way with your teenager, it really might take a number of weeks of shoulder shrugs, eye rolls, refusals, 
But if you can stay consistent and recognize that you're putting in the time to create the, a better flow for the future and just do your best to, to stay consistent and keep inviting them to the conversation, I think that would be step one, right? So just consistency through those uncomfortable moments. And the second point is that it is also more than just acceptable. It is helpful for parents to also hold certain expectations. And that might mean that an expectation is to have family meeting every Sunday. And that really might not be something that the teenager wants to do. But it is okay for parents to invite their teenagers to do some, something that they don't really desire to do. They don't want to do. They're refusing to do. Um, when you can express the purpose and acknowledge that, yes, I want to hear you and this is my expectation, you know, I think that's something that teenagers are often actually seeking. They are looking for accountability and they are looking for structure, even if and when they begin to reject it, it is helpful and it is something that they often want. Um, so again, consistency, but also clear expectations with a purpose are very helpful. I think certainly for me as a parent, it is very much that kind of, I also, I often try and get across the fact that I might not have the right answer. I might not actually know what it is that needs to be known in this situation. But what I do have is the experience of being older. Um, and sometimes that just opens the door to kind of, but if you think I'm wrong, then, you know, we can talk about that, you know, because we don't know what your perception is until you actually tell us. And so until you get that dialogue going, it's very different to hear. And, and, and I think also giving it some sort of time perspective as well, it's like that... The, the, the sense that you know when you were a toddler and you wanted to play in the road my experience told me that, that that was dangerous and no matter how much you wanted to do it and how much you might have had some kind of <laughs> breakdown I wasn't going to let you do it because I know that that's a dangerous thing to do and of course those things change as you get older and you have to let the reins go and you have to give them more flexibility but within that we do also have that experience of knowing even though I know you want to push that boundary now, it's not quite the right time as we believe it in our experience. And I, and I think when they can sort of see that, because if we talk back to that toddler thing, they couldn't disagree because, you know, of course, you were keeping me safe. You knew what you thought was best. And I think if they can understand that, like you say, when the emotion's not full of it, then I guess they start to understand what you're trying to do in that kind of them understanding you as well as, as we spoke before, the parents' role in it as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really appreciate that. And, you know, I, I, was been, I was working with a family recently, and one of the activities that we came up with was for the family to sit down together and actually discuss and write down and visualize what everybody in the family believed the different roles of the family were. And so what I mean is that, you know, everybody at the table got to explore what do they believe a parent's role and job is. And I think that that's a really powerful experience because, you know, if a teenager actually pauses and thinks about, yeah, what is my parent's job? They often are going to acknowledge that the job is to be providing expectations. It is to be setting boundaries. And, you know, so I think coming, coming to that conversation from a sort of neutral space, it's not in the middle of a conflict. It's not to actually have to solve a particular problem. It was literally just to explore and be curious about and name how everybody in the family viewed the role of, te you know, child, teenager, parent. Um, so I think, you know, what you're talking about is really just establishing and communicating what these roles are. I think I think it's brilliant, and I know we could go on for hours talking about, about this. <laughs> um, so, um, and 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 at the end of the show, we'll make sure that everyone's got um, links and everything to your website, so they can find out much more about this specific thing. But I thought it was a really important thing to really discuss as we got going, because of course, you know, as parents, as teenagers listening, I, th I think they're really key things, and I think to under to have these conversations in a different environment, like on a podcast, you know, that people maybe just in the car on the way to school or whatever, it's just a uh, and a, a way of just sort of oh yes we can just oh yes oh we said that or we, we can chat about that later or whatever it happens to be and I think it's just a okay. great way for for people to really understand how that works and, and I'm looking forward to these our, our normal set of questions now just to see how having heard all those things that you believe and all those things that you work with how some of these other questions that we go through sort of really spill into that and how that sort of forms the form those ideas so this is great absolutely so what does your life look like now and how is it different from when you were growing up? Yeah, great question. So um, 
now I live in Texas and I am living in a state and a place where I have only one family member and that's my spouse. And um, so I'm, I'm really in a different, you know, I don't have the same level of family support here where I am. So that's been very interesting to begin to find my support network in a very new way as an adult. And I, growing up, um, I didn't ever really have one clear path of what I expected I may do, you know, in my professional or adult life. I was always a creative. I was always writing and and just doodling and just had this creative energy. And then even in college, I was still kind of like, what is my path? Where am I going? And in my senior year of college, I went to an information session about Teach for America. And I realized, oh, my gosh, this thing that everyone's been telling me you know, about teaching, because I was an English major, and everyone said, oh, what are you going to do with that, teach? And I kept saying, oh, no, no, no. Um, But I went to the info session, and I was very moved, and I was inspired to give education, you know, um, a try. And so it's very interesting, because I did spend the bulk of my adult life so far as a classroom teacher, Um, And I I was really inspired by those first few years and that propelled me into the next years and the next years until I taught for 10 years. And, you know, so school was a part of my life from, you know, as early as I can basically remember my life all the way through about (laughs) age 30 and even 31. And so now as an entrepreneur, I'm no longer working in a school and I'm uh, owning my, I own my own business and I work for myself. And so, you know, things have gone from quite structured in a sense to being a lot more flexible and a lot more managed by myself. Um, So, you know, those are some really big changes and transformations I've gone through in the last several years. And I think especially in this in this day and age where you know, people talk about portfolio careers and, and how all these things develop, you know, it's like, you know, the teaching element, the, the, the child element, the, those relationship things, that seems to be a thing that stayed constant. It just happens to be that your working environment is different. Um, and so I, I think that's why understanding what your your true passion is or your what really lights you up is important because no matter how the jobs may change or the environment of where you're doing what you're doing changes there's usually an element there which is really the guiding light absolutely yes that is exactly it you're right and what was valuable about your school experience Well, this is interesting because I went to a very small school from grades four through eight, um, and I feel like that was a really valuable experience for me. The school, I think from kindergarten through eighth grade, had just about 200 students, and in my class, so in my grade level, there were just about 18 of us. It, It varied year to year, but when we graduated as eighth graders, there were 18 of us, and this really small community felt like a safe a safe learning environment for me to really be myself. Uh, there really didn't, in my perspective, I did not experience a great deal of this sort of com- competitive nature. And it was kind of, I just felt like I had every option available to me. For example, I played all of the different sports and you didn't really have to try out with a fear of failure. If you showed up for tryouts, you made the team. And if you wanted to be in the science fair, you could be in the science fair. It was kind of like every, I could just try on and explore any amount of options that I wanted to. And being in that small environment felt extremely safe for me to take those risks. And so I would say that that was one of the most, you know, valuable and supportive time periods that that I have had, you know, as a student. I really love that and and I think that really is what early year education should be about it should be trying things out it's experimentation it's just having a go in a really broad way you know whether that happens to be you know some music some sports you know like mm-hmm. say science fair whatever it happens to be because it's only by doing these things and I think what I loved about what you were just saying is the fact that if if the environment is so nurturing as that really sounded like, then it really gives you an inherent sense of, of what learning's all about because that's exactly what we do when we're children, isn't it? We try things, we have a go, we do the things we like, we sort of suddenly get rid of the things we're less bothered about. But if you can do it and you've been nurtured in that really fundamental way, then it sounds like it was beautiful. 
Yes, absolutely. And as I heard you reflect that back, I also was just feeling the sense of like, sort of abundance that there's this like, this feeling of, you know, that there is enough for everybody and everybody is well, there's sort of in that nurturing environment, there is just this feeling of enoughness and abundance, which is interesting because I'll talk about enoughness, you know, later in response to one of the questions. But I find that, you know, oftentimes our doubts as humans comes from, am I blank enough? You know, am I smart enough? Am I pretty enough? Am I hardworking enough, right? We have sometimes these doubts wrapped, wrapped up in this enoughness and this nurturing abundant environment just led to, to my, you know, this experience of like, yeah, there was no, I never doubted that. I never doubted myself. Yeah. No, it sounds really wonderful. Which teachers do you remember and why? Well, I, in thinking about this, so high school was actually a much harder time for me than my elementary to middle school time. Um, and so when I was in secondary or high school, I had a couple of teachers that I remember being, I felt like they modeled for me how to challenge the status quo. They modeled how to think critically and really how to speak up, speak out and follow your values. And the two teachers that are coming to mind actually were, I went to a Catholic high school and they were actually um, theology teachers, but I guess um, I didn't see them in the same way that I saw a lot of my other previous religious education teachers. I, I found that these teachers, yes, taught about Catholic values, but did it through this very contemporary exploratory lens of figuring out how do we use these values in our world today. And that experience led me to to join in part of an underground newspaper, to begin participating in some protests, to stand up for things that were happening in the archdiocese of our that our school system was in that I didn't agree with. And so I what I essentially found through the support of these teachers was my voice. And I felt like my voice mattered and that it was important that I, I share it in community. It's something which I've heard before um, as we've gone through the podcast. And I think it's a really important thing is that actually when these things are relevant to you today in whatever world you happen to find yourself in, then the whole thing comes alive, doesn't it? Because no matter how good the teaching is about something which is slightly abstract, it's very different when it's personal. And I think what that does is it's personal from an education point of view, and then you've got the personalities between the teachers and the people, like you say, that are modelling how to do things. And I think that's a very powerful way, or a very powerful combination when those things happen. Mm, absolutely, yes. Who did you admire when you were young, and what was it about that person that had such an impact? Well, the first person that came to mind with this question is one of my aunts. Um, I, I, felt, I had this sense from a pretty young age that she wanted to hear me. We didn't live in the same state. I grew up in New Mexico, and she was living in California, so we didn't see each other all that often. But when we did, I just had this feeling of like, kind of kind of the way I was describing the experience with these teachers, right? That I had this sense that I could be seen and I could be heard and I could share, you know, real life challenges or questions or curiosities that I had in this way that it felt safe to just, you know, say them, process them and and really sort, you know, so again, I, I guess the thread in all of my last three answers is this sense of nurturing. And, and so one of, you know, this aunt in particular, really normalized for me she was one of the people that normalized how interesting and challenging the human experience could be and and just having a safe place to problem solve and to vent and to celebrate gave me a lot of support and just a lot of confidence right that you know we don't have to struggle alone and so when you have that sense of safety and being able to share and be your real human self with somebody it, it can be quite powerful um, and how does that make you feel now in terms of where you are in your life and what you're doing day to day? Because it just really sounds to me um, in that sort of alchemist kind of way that all of these things that you're describing have just led you to the perfect point in terms of what you're now delivering. <laughs> I know I was kind of laughing, actually thinking of the as I was speaking the last words of the last answer that, 
Yes, I mean, that's what I believe is my most important role in my job is really to be witness to other people and their humanness and to affirm them in that experience. So you're right, it's absolutely all intertwined and, and you know, it's exactly my life experiences have led me to be in this role and to be in this space to allow other people to feel nurtured. And of course, I can never determine um, someone else's safety. They have to choose if they feel safe in relationship with me or in, you know, in a coaching relationship. It is it, it is up to me to be a facilitator and a, and a space holder, but, um, you know, someone else gets to decide if and when they're safe. And I do my very best with every single person I have the honor of working with to nurture that space and to nurture the relationship. It's true. Yeah, it's a really great thing. And the other thing that just struck me is the fact that these things happen at a time in our life and sometimes we might be wanting to get there faster. We might not understand what the lessons are that we're learning but actually sometimes we just have to have faith in terms of it's all part of a bigger picture which at some point will probably become clear to us but it may be it's not right now you just have to hold on to the fact that this is it's an integral part of something which you maybe you can't see the whole of true very very true <laughs> yes we're always planting seeds and and even if all we see is the seed or you know just the one little particle then that's still a part of it a part of the journey yeah for sure what was the best piece of advice you've ever been given and who gave it to you so I was actually thinking when I was thinking of my aunt, uh, she would just tell me kind of, it was, I can't quite exactly remember her words, but the effect of what she said was, you know, always be true to you. Um, this, this idea, you know, that we hear quite often, but really listening to your heart. And for me, what I've realized that that has meant over time is that when I trust and follow my inner locus of control rather than looking to the outside for validation. When I trust what's inside and in my heart, that's almost always the truth. And when I say the truth, I mean, you know, these truths of humanity that we are all connected and that we are all love and, and not in a bypassing type of way, but when we recognize that, you know, the real humanity when within each of us is about love and is about, um, this being together and being with one another, I think we can, um, yeah, we just enter the world with a lot more self-love and self-acceptance. And then that also provides us the openness to connect with others. So the staying true to, to who we are, that was something that was very valuable for me and has also continued to support me, you know, continue, it was a support when I was in an adolescence, but has continued to support me as I take different kinds of risks, you know, from starting my own business to creating new projects moving forward. And so when it's coming from this inner locus of control and what is true in my heart, then I, I almost always, uh, even if the success doesn't look the way maybe the external world tells us success looks, it feels good in my being. And I trust that I, I did the best thing for me and for the world. Yeah, I really love that. And and what struck me is that if you look through that lens or those conversations we were having right at the very beginning about maybe a conflict with with a teenager or a situation that you don't like, if when you sort of start all of those things or when you're thinking about it, like you say, either before or after any situation may have, have come up, when that's where you're starting from, all these things all these things seem to seem to just sort of fall away and become a, a lot less of a big deal, it seems to me. And it's much more like you say, when we understand who we are and therefore the, our relationship with other people and, and the connection that we do have, then 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 the stories are very different and then in fact there's no story at all it just is like you mm -hmm. say two people connecting in that in that sort of most authentic way yes exactly what advice would you give your younger self so my younger self this goes uh back to when i was talking about the enoughness but my younger self really needed to know and i still i actually practice inner child meditation and i've written some blog posts about inner child meditation and inner teenager um healing but i still am working with my teenage self and reminding her that she is enough and so for me this idea of enough it just puts a pause when i say i am enough or when i tell my teenage self you are enough 
I, I just feel this pause in my body that I just kind of have to stop and really think about like, what does that mean? And it ultimately always brings me to this idea that like, I am worthy of love and I'm worthy to be here and to take up space however I am in any given moment. Um, some moments that's going to be when I feel very joyful and celebratory and other times that's going to be when I feel depressed and struggling. And in any of those moments and anywhere in between, I'm still enough and I still am worthy to be here. And so those are some of the sort of phrases and affirmations that I use in continuing to process and heal some of the wounds of my inner child and teenager. And I think the important thing to to re- to remember when we hear things like this is it's it can be harder to process when you are a teenager. And like you say, it, it's things that a lot of us work on as as we get older and, and we start to understand life in a, in a slightly different context. But I think it's really supportive, even if you are a teenager, hearing these sorts of things for the first time. It just opens up that world slightly that it's not straightforward. You know, it's hard mm-hmm. being a teenager. There's all sorts of things which you tell a story about yourself because it's something that comes from you or something that other people have told you or just the fact that society says teenagers act like this um and i think i think even if it's difficult to comprehend sometimes just understanding that it's a thing is is a really is a really important thing yeah beautifully said definitely what does your future look like Well, my future looks like continuing to work with teens and their families. Um, I'm really excited. In the next month, I'm starting an online group specifically for high schoolers that's going to be a combination of sort of like a a centering and checking in in the middle of the week to offer connection and to offer motivation, as well as to learn some practical tools for stress management and self-care. Um, So that's coming really soon, and I'm excited about that. I'm a writer. I publish each week, typically each Tuesday on my blog, and so I see in my future just continued writing, and I would love to – I have sort of the idea and sense that one day I'll write some – a novel, a YA fiction novel. So I kind of put that out there into the universe, and I hope that that's something that this I'm planting the seeds for now. Um, I have – I'm in process with another book that is for parents. It's all about self-care and mindfulness as well as communication tools for parenting teenagers. So there's a lot of kind of interesting energy that I have in this this work as Courtney Harris coaching. Um, And then I'm also going to become a birth doula. And so this is something that I am going to be starting soon, which is that I will be an assistant to people who are giving birth. Um, before birth, during birth, and after birth. And so really the way that I see my life like continuing to unfold is that I am an ally to families through times of transitions. Oh, that's lovely. And and, and I, lo- I love that, that phrase of my life unfolding because that's, fun. that's got a really... Um, it's got a really warm feel about it that a sense mm. that it is just unfolding as we're going it's all part there it's all there for us to have rather than making big decisions or or it needs to look like x or needs to look like y you know it's just unfolding as we're getting there and I really love that it sounds fantastic thank you what podcast book video film or song or, or any resource has had a, the biggest impact on your life and why was that This is a hard one to answer because it's so many, right? You know, I think even in just today, I've talked about a few different frameworks (laughs) and and books and, you know, ways that I learn. I I definitely love reading and podcasting. And so uh, what came to mind today, though, is The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And I, I always tell people about this book because it offers four different agreements that we can make with ourselves And these are agreements that create a foundation for much of what we've talked about, much of this um, self-acceptance, not taking other people personally, um, speaking truths to ourselves and to others, meaning, you know, speaking kind and loving words. Um, And so all of these, all of the messages from this book just, to me, affirm, they affirm how challenging it is to be human, but also make space for how we can really deepen our connection to ourselves and others. And um, I'm actually in the middle of writing a, a four part blog series about how we can apply the four agreements to friendship because friendship is one of the very top topics 
that teenagers express to me, but also parents are often concerned about. And so uh, this book has just been uh, amazing in my life. And in fact, two years ago, I I listened to the audio book four, four or five times in the one year, and it's definitely sort of a tradition for me to listen to it at least a few times a year. So I would say it's a it's a, one of my top influences. Yeah, no, no, I can really understand that. And we'll have links to links to the book and all the things we've been talking about on the show notes. So you can go to educationonfire.com forward slash Courtney Harris and, and all those will come up for you. So you can just click straight through. Um, for those people that are, are really excited about what you've been talking about and the fact that you've got so much that you can offer people um, from here on in, especially, like say, from parents and, and the teenagers' point of view, what's the best way for people to find out more? Yes, thanks for asking. So my website is CourtneyHarrisCoaching.com. I'm on Instagram. I love facilitating conversations about a whole range of topics and big challenging questions. And so that's at Courtney Harris Coaching. That's on Instagram. I'm also on Facebook. That's another good way to get a hold of me. Um, and yes, those are. I would love to hear from folks. You know, to hear what questions you have in following up from this episode, and even just you know what insights you have or what has stuck out and been helpful from today. So, I, I love conversation. So I would really appreciate anybody that has has listened to reach out. It's brilliant, I think, when people do take the effort to comment and, and to interact because, like, you know, we've had a fantastic conversation and we've ebbed and flowed. But there's, there's obviously a whole array of different of different perspectives and and people's ideas. And so, I think when it can be expanded by people then chipping in afterwards, I, I love that. So, yeah, I've, I'm I'm all for people reaching out and um and continuing this conversation. So, well, thank you, Courtney, for sharing your wisdom and allowing us to learn from your experiences. Oh, well, thanks so much for hosting a, a conversation and for just being so thoughtful in your words and ideas that you share here. Thanks for listening to the Learning on Fire podcast. For more information, please visit educationonfire.com and follow the links from the homepage. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.